Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in today to the Driven to Better podcast, where everyone you'll hear is driven to make business better. I'm your host, Justin Sisley, and on the show today are Taylor and Cedric of Spectrum. They're going to share with us their journeys to entrepreneurship, including what they're doing now that puts them on the cutting edge of an incredible growth industry. So stay tuned to hear about it. We've got a great show coming up. And we're here with Taylor and Cedric from Spectrum, that's spelled S-P-E-C-T-R-O-M, and they're going to tell us a little bit about why and a little bit about what they do. Why don't you start out with uh, just giving us kind of your elevator pitch on on what Spectrum does. So uh, we saw a problem with 3D printing, uh, the consumer market, you know, you're starting to see brands like MakerBot uh, come around and people are seeing 3D printers enter their homes, but... 3D printing is like a hot glue gun for plastic, and the hot glue only comes out in one color. And we started thinking about how we could fix that. And and we put our heads together. We used a combination of uh, computer engineering, uh, a lot of chemical and polymer engineering too, and we came out with a solution that was uh, uh, apparently newsworthy. (laughs) And uh, we're we're pushing it, seeing how far we can take it. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, and the results have been awesome. So, so yeah. for the for the layman, you basically add you're adding color to 3D printing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about I guess your guys's background, how you met, and how the company kind of. Yeah. So I guess it all starts in. out um, when I was really young. I got into making websites, and when I was 18, I started a web design firm. And Cedric here had an idea that it was similar to a company called CoRide here in Madison, which basically helps students travel to other cities with other students and he came to me wanted me to make him that website but I just didn't think it was the right idea but me and Cedric were talking and we realized we're really familiar people and and we were really like-minded and we knew we wanted to eventually do a startup someday but this just wasn't the right idea Um, so I'll let Cedric continue here yeah so uh, we decided to to kibosh the idea and then uh, I got together with my buddy Chase and we we tackled this 3d printing problem and we had so many just weeks of no success, you know, no color coming out or that we'd break uh, printer parts and stuff like that. And finally we came to a solution and we were demonstrating this solution at um, the Innovation Days competition in the engineering school in uh, in February. And Taylor just happens to walk by our booth. Uh, I thought it was pretty neat. Um, we We recruited him to join the team. And then we entered another student competition together. Uh, this was a business plan. And one of the companies we were up against in the business plan competition was pretty much like a photocopy of that original idea we had. And it was kind of cool to think that, you know, we looked at it and we took first place in the competition. So we we essentially beat out our old idea. So <laughs> we, we improved together. So that was okay. pretty cool. Awesome. So kind of help me understand, I'm new to the whole 3D printing thing. Like I realize it's a big fad now, but I'm completely unfamiliar with it. To me, your analogy of a hot glue gun is is perfect. That's kind of how I saw it. But to me, isn't it just you put in red glue and red stuff comes out? Is it that simple or is it, there must be more to it? Traditionally, yeah. I mean, that's that's, uh, how how they work. And what we're doing is how do we selectively decide exactly what color is coming out of that hot glue nozzle essentially uh, at whatever time and that's sort of the, uh, the the proprietary stuff that's been we've been improving so you're able to do kind of multicolored things is what you're saying it's that's not right. just like load in red and now you make a red thing and yeah. then load in blue and now you make a blue thing you can combine those into one one piece yeah like, okay like right now if you have a maker bot what they're doing is they're giving you multiple extruders so it's almost similar to if you had an inkjet printer and you just fed in multiple colors of pe- uh, multiple pieces of paper of different color and then tried to scramble them together to create a multicolored print. That's what 3D printers are doing now. Okay. But our approach is more of trying to add color to it in a more strategic manner so we don't have to just hash together different colors of paper, essentially, or in this case, filament. Um, instead, we add our colors on demand. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Can I can I actually chime in with a question? As yeah. well? No, no, you can't. <laughs> um, yeah, go thank, ahead. Th- thank you, Justin, <laughs> for your permission. Um, so, so my understanding of three D printing is that you're you know creating a mold, um, and who cares what color the mold is? Tell me why adding color to what's being printed um, is beneficial to an, an end user. Yeah, well, actually, 
you, you're creating the the final object, uh, so it's not actually the mold. Um, okay. Because it's a thermoplastic, so the the plastic that comes out. It's the same kind of plastic they use in Legos. Okay. So you can you know they're functional. Uh, they're they're hard enough to prototype with. Um, but yeah, right now it's just that whole part, the whole thing that you want, whether it's a, a figurine or a piece for an engineering uh, design. Okay. That's all one solid color, and so. You know, if you want to print Spider Man, he doesn't have eyes or a red and blue suit at all. So, that and a lot of people like to print even GIFs or they're getting really creative. There's a website called Thingiverse where people just put thousands and thousands of 3D files. And if you go on there, your imagination will go wild. But quickly you'll see that a lot of the files on there look like crap and they're monocolor. So, gotcha. uh, with our device, ideally, you'll be able to just load up those objects and Put your own colors on them and you won't even have to sit there and babysit your printer and swap out filament spools anymore you'll just be able to click go come back and have your full colored print waiting for you awesome okay very cool Thanks. um so is this kind of you guys are young guys i know we were talking before the interview um cedric is a recent grad taylor's still in college last year right correct yep so how long have you guys had kind of the entrepreneurial bug uh i would say my first entrepreneurial adventure. I mean, Taylor's probably got some more successful stories than me, but um, I was actually in China two summers ago and I was taking a class where we had to we had to print assignments almost every day and there was only one place uh, in, in like the near campus area that spoke English and would print things for students. Um, the problem was their every single one of their computers was full of viruses. So if you brought a hard, if you bought a flash drive, it was like essentially a single-use flash drive because if you brought it back to your computer, you would have Windows jumping around, and we had a couple kids have to buy a new hard drive actually because it totally corrupted it. And so, uh, one of my good buddies and I, we we saw a business opportunity uh, out of other people's plight, and we ran to the local Walmart, which is a totally different Walmart experience than what we have here. It's a they sell live turtles and stuff. and um, <laughs> So we go there and we buy uh, a paper printer, the cheapest one we can get. We get refills and refills of ink. We buy like a bulk. And we started Badger Prints out of our dorm room in China. And we put up like, um, like a thing on our door and we said, okay, for the, for the next six weeks or for the next three weeks, you're going to have the printer. And for the next three weeks after that, I'll have the printer. And people can just come to us, uh, ask us to print off their homework. And we'll charge them twenty five cents a page. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and it worked. Uh, we 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 doubled our money, and we at the end sold the printer back to the university. And um, huh. so it was. Uh, that was probably the first thing where I exchanged cash for uh, opportunity. I guess. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> and for me as a kid, I was just always interested in kind of taking things apart and understanding them. And when I was say thirteen, I got into trying to understand websites because. Um, I guess I, I looked at apps and um, specifically like when I was a kid there was Blackberry, iPhone, Android and I thought it was stupid that if you made an app on one of these devices you were restricted to those devices and you couldn't let the whole world see what you created so I got really deep into websites because I liked the fact that you could create them and the whole world could see them all you would need is a computer so I started understanding how to make websites and by the time I was 17 I came up with this idea of uh, at the time, there was a lot of affiliate networks and surveys. You've probably seen them in mobile games where mm -hmm. instead of saying, pay me a dollar, they'll say, do a survey and I'll give you this in the game. Um, so what I did is I got all of those surveys from different companies and I put them on a website and I found lots of kids that had a lot of time and very little money. And <laughs> I said, come to my website and do these surveys for me and I'll give you some of the money that I get and I'll pay you your game cards or whatever your heart desires, I guess. And it ended up actually working out really great. Um, I ended up being able to pay off all my college with it, but as it wow. grew exponentially, it, it got to a point where it was making almost $1,000 a day. And at that point, there was a lot of issues with, um, say, fraud. And at the time, I was a college student, and it was just very tough for me to deal with. So I came to the hard decision that I wanted to sell it off. And uh, once I sold it off, I, I used a website called Flippa, which I highly recommend for anyone in, in the web design business, I guess. Yeah. That's where you can buy and sell websites. And that was a good experience, and I was able to sell my first company and move on to create a web design company, which ultimately two years down the road led me to meeting Cedric here. So, Okay. Wow. Awesome. 
Very cool. That yeah, that was yeah. Great, like I said, uh, two different versions of success. I paid off a like a seventy dollar printer, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was gonna say, were you buying Ferraris then after you were charging oh, you know twenty five cents a page? <laughs> well, in China, you probably buy uh, anything if you look look hard enough. You know. Well, yeah. in China, that Ferrari is actually a Pontiac Fiero with a body kit, so be careful there. That's cool. No, you guys did a great job of kind of bringing together your two stories into uh, where you guys met. So, and then Spectrum has been around for how long now? So, uh, like I said, Chase and I were the initial guys that, that kind of met and started. So, it go, that goes back a year before. So, it was that same engineering competition, but the year before, and it was Chase and our other co-founder, Mike. They were competing, making this thing called the Orkin. And it sounds so cool, and it was kind of cool. It was like an all-in-one washer and dryer of clothes. Uh, and it was supposed to be for gyms, and it was supposed to be small volumes, and I mean, the idea is there, and the idea is still relevant, but, um, so they, they entered this thing, and they, they took, like, the lumberjacks approach to engineering or something. They were, uh, so their, their idea was using air to, to, to warm and whatever, so they bought, like, a $400 centrifugal fan, and if, that could, like, blow somebody over. It was insane, and they had wow. this thing duct taped into, like, a... A barrel with a water line leading in and basically when it came to demo day for this competition Uh-oh. it was like the, the judges were begging them to turn it off you know like to, <laughs> to stop the sound because it was so loud that it was like deafening and I was actually competing in the competition against them uh, solo and I made um, a an automated French press coffee machine and that was that was fun anyway so the the claim to fame was that um, so Chase and I were, were competing, we're in the same major, and we're like, you know, nobody in our major had really taken home a prize in this competition, and it comes to award day, and uh, I win, and he doesn't, <laughs> and, <laughs> but I went to see him right after, right after the, the, the event, because I thought it still was a great idea, and I said, you know, would you do it again next year, and without hesitation, after he just, you know, spent all this money on this prototype, and didn't win a thing, and he was completely deflated about it, he didn't even hesitate, he goes, yes. I, I can't wait to do it again next year. That was so much fun. And to me, that was like, okay, this guy is doing it for the right reason. He's loving the, the hacking part. He's loving creating. And so immediately in the fall, we started thinking of ideas, messed up a lot of, uh, of good hardware, and then came to something that worked. And now we're, then we got Taylor and Mike on board. And Mike actually just quit his job at, at Medline. Uh, Chase just quit his job at AbbVie. Uh, I quit my job at uh, an oil company, and yeah, it was just like it's all—it's all like happening. So it could fail. I don't know. Okay, so you guys are kind of all in at this point. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Thanks. All right. Well, we're gonna kind of um, talk a little bit more about um, maybe just just the nuts and bolts of the beginning here. Yeah. So, so I've got a question for you guys. You know, you've got this this idea for three D printing. Um, what did it take to get the company up and running. Did you guys have access to 3D printers in the beginning? Did you have to kind of invest in your own equipment? Tell us about kind of the very startup um, logistics of getting access to 3D printers. Yeah, that's really funny. Um, well, now 3D printing is becoming so democratized. I mean, you can buy one for 500 bucks if you want. Mm-hmm. And so it's not too hard to get your hands on something to make other things. And it's a critical tool now for prototyping. But um, I think there are two factors at play. First of all, we had access to Sector 67, which is the, the hacker space in Madison. Nice. And they gave us a lot of, you know, very quick access to tools. They taught us how to use things. And just the people there are fantastic. I mean, if you have any question, people won't hesitate to sit down and talk to you. So yeah. that, that was important. Um, and then also being students, we were forgiven for a lot of mistakes, you know, and um, I think we kind of abused that one a little bit because they gave us a lot of opportunities and we weren't, we weren't expected to succeed. And when we did, we were like kind of pushed to the front page of websites and stuff. So um, I think w- the number one thing that, that was important with starting up was uh, trying to learn as much as possible, uh, especially here. 3D printing, nobody knows. It, like the whole market is kind of a, we kind of look at it as like a big mess. No one knows what's going on. No one knows who the market leader is. And everyone knows a little bit more than the next person in a different area. And so sure. just trying to learn from everybody. You, you mean you guys didn't learn all about 3D printing in your undergrad? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so for me, I mean, when Cedric pitched the idea, I'd never really even, I mean, I'd heard about 3D printing, but I didn't know much about it at all. And what really shocked me is the fact that we were able to kind of pinpoint this industry, and within a matter of two months, I was able to pretty much call myself an expert of 3D printing. It was literally that small of a field. It's not very complicated at all once you once you dive into it. And sure. I, did, I did notice that once you do dive into it, not only do you understand it better, obviously, but you start seeing more facets within the business that could be improved on, to the point where even if Spectrum did fail, which it's not going to, but if it did, there's so many, so many possibilities, things you could do in the industry that you see once you're inside it. So, nice. Yeah, yeah that's that's very cool. 3D printing is definitely a part of uh, a big part of the future, and it's it's kind of, it's got to be neat for you guys to be to be living that that future. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I even I think when I wanted to get Taylor on board, I told him that you know this is the kind of technology. It doesn't you know once a generation do you get. Uh, technologies that are really changing things um, and they're you know the iPhone change stuff and like you know all the all these critical things but 3d printing has the potential to go in the hardware realm that nothing has in you know my recent history even come close to the totally. potential impact so thanks well it sounds like yeah you guys got a, a good start and we'll let uh, Justin if you don't mind carry on with um, the not so glamorous parts yeah, so and I want to point out one thing that, that Cedric mentioned that seems to be a recurring theme with everybody we've interviewed, and it's that community. Your, your community at sec Sector 67 was uh, you know, pretty much essential to your growth and, and your starting of the company, mm -hmm. and we get a lot of people through here, um, a few members of 100 State who said, yeah, like the other people around them are their biggest, biggest influence. They're, they're the people that they look to. Mm -hmm. um, so we just can't stress enough how important it is to Absolutely. have that community. Find that community if you're listening and you're you're kind of thinking about jumping on board this entrepreneurial train. Start out by just finding that community. There 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 are co-working spaces, there are hacker spaces, whatever you want to call it, in just about every city. Um, so just go out there and find it, and that's going to be the best way to start. But um, let's uh, let's talk about one of the things that uh, every business has um, probably several failures um, but it's important obviously for learning what's uh, is, is there something that sticks out in your guys' minds that was kind of a big like oh whoops moment the, there are plenty of technical failures there's never I don't think been it, we, we we look at this and it's just kind of crazy to us that we've we've had a really good track record so far so something bad is about to happen we've yeah. what I'd say <laughs> is we haven't had any huge pivots yet but every single day we see new tactical challenges and what I think is important is it's not seeing those technical challenges and getting depressed and and being mad and upset that you're getting them but seeing them and and kind of learning from them understanding that they're there and trying your best to kind of move beyond them and figure out how to uh, how you can ultimately take them on and fix them and um, like, I, like I said, every day we're seeing more and more, but uh, obviously any, any business you have, you're going to get those, and it's just about moving past them and doing all you can to... Yeah. yeah I, I, this, this is a, a funny question, because there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of struggle, but we haven't, we haven't had like a failure moment, and I, I'm sure it's imminent. I really, I really think that, <laughs> that that's the best way to learn uh, about certain things, fail small, but... Well, let me ask you this. So you guys are at a point right now, you're, you're kind of in R&D still, yep. right? Yep. So at some point, there comes a requirement for monetization. Absolutely. And are you guys there yet or no? So in January, um, we're not releasing specific details just yet, but that's where we'll be announcing our, our first product launch. Okay. Um, so we've just received some funding to help us get there and solidify some some of the technical aspects and uh, we're going to be at one of the biggest uh, stages to, to, to make this announcement so okay. it'll, be, it'll be very exciting in you're not going to tell us that stage uh, we'll, we'll tell you right before it happens All right. <laughs> um, so I guess given that you're, you're heading towards that point where you're going to have to start doing sales um, is that something you're um, dreading a little bit or do you have a sales guy on the team how do you plan on tackling that <laughs> well, like I said I think being uh, open to learning is has been really important to us. So, no, we do not have a quote-unquote sales guy, but 
we have we've surrounded ourselves by advisors and the kind of mentors that are so uh, involved with this project that they're um, you know sort of not telling us what to do but they're really helping us get a very good idea of this world that we have never been in um, and whether it comes from reading books doing the lean startup approach where you're interviewing customers and stuff um, that is definitely a place where I could see us having uh, more stories for you in like six months <laughs> okay and what makes me feel good is Basically, any time we're releasing pictures of things we've been printing or yeah. showing them in shows, we're getting nas- or nationwide uh, um, just people contacting us um, from Ecuador, Netherlands, all over the place saying, wow, this is awesome. Like, what can I do to get my hands on a prototype? And yeah. for me, that's what really keeps me going. So. Yeah, yeah okay. we, we just got, like, the other day, some guy from New Zealand. Like, I don't even have the same last name as my parents, and he called my house phone <laughs> looking really? for a pre-order. And this was... You know, we don't even have like an order form on our website. We don't have any of that. And, you know, he was desperately wanting to get uh, one of these. So uh, the, the feedback tells us that it's going to be there. Uh, I don't have any doubt that we can sell these. I think I think the the biggest challenge we might have is um, is looking at how do we how do we grow from just the actual idea and start marketing it as a product, uh, not just like a cool idea. But we know we know it works. It's packaging it, making it look pretty, and and getting the right team to support it too. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. I want to break in quickly just to give a quick shout out and thank you to our sponsors, starting with MadisonInABox.com. It's the perfect gift for anyone with a connection to the great city that I call home. Someone who used to live here is a university alum, or maybe just someone who would appreciate a taste of our local culture. Send friends, family, and loved ones the gift of Madison. In a box. Head over to madisoninabox.com to learn more about this unique gift idea. Our other sponsor for the show is Frutera.co. Get ready to blend organic smoothies in under 30 seconds. And the best part is they're shipped right to your door. There's several flavors to choose from, so head over to Frutera.co to learn more. And while you're there, drop them an email. Say, hey, thanks for sponsoring the Driven to Better podcast. I really appreciate it. All right, back to the show. Well, you, you guys don't have a lot of failures yet, which is fantastic. Um, but also, like you said, you know they're coming, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just prepare yourselves. But let's talk about you know let's talk about some of the things now. The good part, what what uh, things that have been working for you? Sure. So so here I'd ask you, you know, what are you currently doing with your business that is working well for you? What's what's generating the most sales? Um, but instead, let me let me switch gears since you guys aren't at that point, uh, and tell us about some of the the press you got in the beginning. It seems like the media has been talking about you. Um, why don't you go into detail about that? Yeah, so something that's really opened my eyes working with Spectrum is that there's a lot of ideas out there that they're obviously going to happen eventually. Like obviously, people are going to be printing things in 3D and color in the future. Like people love color. We we live in color. It's going to happen. But in order to actually achieve that idea and, and make it come true, you just really do need investment and you do need a solid team. And what I've realized with Spectrum is we have created that team and by going to these competitions and showing them how passionate we are about this idea and showing them how deeply we've thought about it, like any question they ask us or any concern, we're always ready to return with a counter statement and, and show them that we've thought about it and, and literally thought every facet through. And that's why I think we've had so much success with all these competitions we've we've went through. We've raised significant funding with without having to return any equity purely because we've been so good at pitching our vision and showing them that we are the team that's going to make this happen. And bef- like I said, um, I, I really had never seen that this was even possible until I joined Spectrum. But if you do find the right team and you find an idea that you're all passionate about, people are going to be ready to throw money at you. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but so the initial press came after that, that first competition when... Chase and I were just messing around and we didn't really, we had, it was, you could hardly call it a prototype, it was a proof of concept, proof that this seed of an idea could maybe mm-hmm. be a product. Um, and, but we were so into the, the color thing and we got contacted by uh, gigaohm.com, which, mm-hmm. is, which is a reporter when we did an interview with them. Uh, and this is, we had no idea what we were. We had like just come home from class and we didn't have a website, we didn't have any of that. <laughs> And we were not ready for the the immediate feedback. It kind of you know exploded right the next day. Um, so when that when that came out, it went from uh, 3D printing like blog to 3D printing website to we were even on CNN Money for a little bit about oh, wow. like about this, and it was like holy. 
crap, you know, we don't even <laughs> know how to this tie is, our shoes really. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is real. Yeah, so that's that was that was the seed of what led to a lot of now the funding opportunities that we've gotten and a lot of the the sort of partnerships that we're exploring now. So um, well, yeah, that 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 publicity, um, I can't stress enough now that I'm thinking about it. The sort of networks that even just at University of Wisconsin, but I'm sure there's all these networks. So the reporter that contacted us found us because she was looking at um, at these, this competition specifically for the winning invention, seeing if it was tech or not. And so she so she loved the idea. She was a 3D printing reporter, and then like that took off. But I don't know what would have happened if we didn't know her or, or like she didn't go to Wisconsin. So um, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, you may not have learned how to print, uh, 3D print in your undergrad, but having, you know, that is one one place where being part of a big academic university um, definitely helps. You have those alumni relationships and um, just a lot of eyes on what's coming out of the University of Wisconsin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so tell us, so you're winning competitions left and right. You've got the right team and the right attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd ask you about funding. You know, was it hard to get this investment to kind of keep you guys afloat? Um, it doesn't sound like it was hard, but tell us a little bit how you got um, how you got some of the advisors and the investment to take you to where you're at today. Yeah, I, I think the, the most critical part that that Taylor touched on was that we were so it, like. In, we, we jumped in with both feet and like, you know, we were completely in the idea before it was even any of these competitions happened. We, you know, took our winter break off and when everyone's, you know, in Panama uh, doing whatever, we were at Sector 67 wait, doing like the 12 hour days sure. uh, to, to make this. And so I think people saw in us, whether it was our engineering professors or, um, or uh, business advisors or whatever, they saw that we were like doing this for real, and that you know we weren't going to stop until we, until we found the solution. And and I think that led to a lot of the early competition success, just the passion that we demonstrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we went on to to try to get this funding, it was um, it, it was sort of funny how how this happened. So uh, we had initially applied for the funding, and it, it was a non equity uh, diluting uh, significant amount, and we were told in the middle of the summer, like a one word, uh, one sentence email, uh, sorry, you're no longer being considered for this. Oh, and and we, were, we were sort of, you know, we were at a, at a loss for words because, you know, we, we'd, we'd done the application, we, we'd started talking to people, but we didn't question it. We were in the middle of a, like, intense class. And I just happened to be at concerts on the square. You've been at concerts on the square. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and I was talking to a friend of mine. And he says, oh, you're doing, you're starting a company. Oh, you should talk to this professor, this professor. And I said, you know, I didn't think much of it. But he set up a meeting for me. So I go talk to the professor. We we chat for like an hour. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry that you didn't qualify. And I didn't even realize he was on the reviewing board. And uh-huh. I said, what, what do you mean qualify? Yeah, he says, oh, yeah, your application was, was denied for, for this reason. I said, well, I mean that's not that's not actually true. He goes, oh wait, maybe it was it was that reason. And I said, well no, that's not that's not true either. He goes, I don't know why you guys weren't called. Why you guys weren't considered? Maybe you should go talk to this guy across town who's in charge of the whole thing. And so we have a meeting with him. And he says, yeah, I don't know either. Maybe it was the wrong email or something. <laughs> and so we go uh, next the next like Wednesday. He sets up a day for us to pitch, and we pitched the whole board and like all, all these people. And it was it was pretty intense because every presentation we had up to that point was ten minutes. Uh, tell us what you got. Tell us how it works. And this was twenty minutes of presentation and twenty five minutes of questions of like mm-hmm. in a small room. And that was that was pretty intense. Uh, it was exhilarating. And then the next week we found out we got it. Uh, and wow. so that was it. Was just like bam, bam, bam. And I I think I uh, taking away and, and questioning things and and really. Uh, trying to to push things as far as like so important I'm seeing yeah wow that's good I have to go move the car because it's about to get towed (laughs) okay (laughs) so this funding you guys received recently given that nobody has a full-time job anymore are you allowed to use that funding to support yourselves like can you buy food and pay rent with that or is that something that's only allowed to go towards the business Fortunately, yes. Uh, I know that's not always the case, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, otherwise, if, if we're worrying in the back of our minds about just the basic essentials like that, like food, rent, gas, uh, it's probably it, actually, <laughs> uh, then I, I don't think we'd be productive. But yeah, we just need enough to make a Costco run every two weeks and enough to pay that rent. And uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Which, how do I get one of these grants? <laughs> <laughs> I need some funding for my uh, my garage. Okay. We'll, we'll talk later. We'll talk. Later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's very cool, and and I think um, it's good to hear from people who are kind of in the university type setting, because um, it's different than than anybody we've talked to thus far. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of get into the last round here, which is more of a uh, quick answer short answer round um just some things that we think are going to be helpful to listeners um based on your experience so far so we'll we'll, i guess we'll start with uh we'll start with cedric and then taylor give you a chance to answer too but who is your biggest inspiration either in business or just in life i think i think the the stuff that really gets me going are are the people who uh are successful and they're making cool things um but making cool things uh, to solve like actual actual problems. I mean, like for example, uh, Instagram is a cool thing, and I use it every day. Uh, but that doesn't get me, you know, fired up like um, someone um, someone like Elon Musk making, you know, the, something that's truly just out of this world and just doesn't even make any sense. So, inspiration for me is just. It's more treading new ground than success, uh, you know, from from uh, you know financial success. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna go with Elon Musk. We can go with <laughs> Elon Musk. That's All right. Fun. Yeah, for me, I'd say it's similar. It's very hard for me to pinpoint it down to a specific person because for me, when I think of like inspiration or success, I think of kind of the thoughts that go behind it. And really what I see is every single successful person you look at, they're kind of having similar thoughts in their mind of they're not really doing it for the money, they're doing it on the ultimate positive impact they're going to have at the end of the day with, with whatever they're pursuing. And, you know, there's uh, there's a book I'll probably get into because I'm sure that's another one of your questions. Oh, yeah. But um, basically Napoleon Hill, Andrew Carnegie, um, Elon Musk, every single one of them, they're doing what they're doing because they want to have a positive impact. So I'd say all of those and, and basically anyone out there who's who's just doing something uh, a, um, specifically in our field Adrian Bauer he's the maker of rep rap and oh, yeah. his vision is basically that he wants these machines these 3d printers he hasn't even referenced them as 3d printers in any of his pitches which is awesome but he wants these these reproducible devices these these self-making devices to just reproduce themselves and ultimately at the end of the day almost take over the world manufacturing where anyone will be able to have what everyone else has like no longer is money even a thing because everyone can just make whatever they want and his vision is just so powerful and for that that reason I'd say he's really one of my top guys too oh yeah his thing oh, I can't believe I didn't think of him he he just it's not even about the machine it's about this like deep philosophical thing about what what they can bring if you if you even let yourself think about it for a second uh, a thing that makes other things uh, just doesn't even make sense. And for him, you know, we have him to think. Once the patents expired on these big industrial sized machines, he made the first kind of 3D printer that was suitable to sit on a desktop. And that's, you know, led uh, to the companies like MakerBot and so on that, that we see now making a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I doubt that he really cares about the, the money for him. It's just beautiful to see this, this vision of his expanding across country. And now, you know what 3d printing is, you know, we're yeah. starting a company about it. And yeah, he's really inspirational. So I'm envisioning, um, Star Trek, uh, the replicators where they just kind of walk up there in the cafeteria <laughs> and they're just like chocolate cake and bam, there's chocolate cake. <laughs> 3d printers are going to do that. You tell me they already uh, are. I, I believe, I think NASA is making printers that will let you print food. Really? Um, just because if you can send those up in a spaceship and put in this, the key ingredients, that would be amazing for astronauts. Like, yo, give me a pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, if you think about it, everything's kind of made from the same stuff at the end of the day. Uh, it's just how you put it together. It's kind of, you know, different things. Okay. Yeah. So. Awesome. So if you guys got a hundred grand, uh, this is not equity, not debt, something, just a windfall. 
what would you do with it? And you got to spend it within the next couple of weeks on the business. What would you do? On the business? On the business. Kind of already in that situation a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic <laughs> consulting. <laughs> Yeah, well, basically, I would start spending it on the smartest people I know here on campus. I'd say the the number one reason I'm I'm happy I'm still a student is because being a student inside my classes, I personally strive to to become friends with the smartest people in my classes. And uh, recently, I can say with much confidence that a guy named Martin that we recently hired, he is definitely one of the smartest CS people that that I've ever met, and so happy to have him on my team. And throwing a hundred grand his way to help him um, work towards our vision gladly because I know that just with his hard working talent and ability that it will fuel us much farther than uh, it w- the, the investment will have a much higher return. So, yeah. 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 Uh, man, I, I just, I would try to come up. I, I mean, that's, that's very valid, but I have to say something different, right? Oh, of course. You don't, uh, <laughs> you don't have any left to spend. He spent it all on Martin already. <laughs> <laughs> so we get 200 grand and we have to spend it. Uh, I, I'm really, you know, I always thought this whole social media manager thing was kind of BS uh, for the longest time because I just, you know, I can use Facebook, I can use Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm really seeing the value of, of social marketing and also just putting together like a, a sexy video that really shows, you know, every angle, everything it can do. Um, for me, it would definitely be getting the word out about not only 3D printing, but, you know, what impact color it's not just a feature this enables so much more for 3d print yeah, yeah. No, that's, for me. that's perfect yeah it's, i mean those are both key things obviously you need the human capital and you need the marketing or you're never going to get any sales so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good perfect our budget. <laughs> so i'm going to ask each of you then and i think i know what yours might be taylor um I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that it's Think and Grow Rich. Definitely, yeah. The the book, the one book you'd recommend. Yep. When I was uh, when I was 16, I was working in Arby's and making shit for pay, obviously. And, yep. Um, my sister actually was is five years older than me, and she was dating a guy named Nate. And Nate was like, "Hey Taylor, I, I know you're not doing anything this August except working uh, at Arby's, so <laughs> you should you should come down to Iowa with me, and we'll go work at the Iowa State Fair." He was a representative for Vitamix, and Vitamix is a $500 blender. So when you're selling those, you really got to sell people on the vision of what this blender is going to do to positively impact their life. And prior to this moment, I was just an introverted CS guy. I would say I was a little bit more extroverted than the typical CS guy, but still I didn't have much pitching experience and talking to people. So here I was with Nate going down to the state fair, and it was a 14-day long fair, and um, obviously I didn't really know what to expect. I knew I could sell people, but I didn't know how well I could sell them. And after the first day, like I was starting to get the hang of it, and definitely going into it, by the end, we, we were the best selling, uh, selling team um, Vitamix had ever had at any state fair that year. Wow, so I'm yeah. selling, selling 30 a day for 14 days. So um, that was the first time where I, I had really started to realize like the value of my time. I had, I had earned more in that 14 days. Uh, obviously, I was working a ton, 10-hour days, but I'd earned more in that 14 days than I had um, the entire summer at Arby's, um, and, and in fact, like tenfold. Um, so I was just like, wow, like, how can I sit there at this Arby's making minimum wage, like literally not learning anything, just, just waiting to be done with the day, um, when here I could be at this state fair pitching to these people. Um, not only am I improving their life, because uh, at least I, I feel I'm improving their life, because I'm teaching them this, this way that they can start eating better food and ultimately changing their, their life positively in that manner, um, but I'm learning also in that way, like how I'm selling to people and, and how I'm pitching to them and how I'm going to convince them to ultimately buy this $500 machine. So. Uh, with this with this opportunity I'm learning all that value in time and I'm, I'm learning how much I can learn when I'm actually doing something that I, I want to be doing or I'm doing proactively and that that ended up going to more sales jobs and ultimately Nate at the end of that show he recommended Think and Grow Rich to me and I started reading that book when I was uh, doing my bus rides to school and it's, it started to be a thing where I was like wow this this guy is really talking not not about money obviously he's talking about this this like idea, uh, idea. I, I, yep, I call it the ether. Still, um, uh, obviously, every great thinker calls it something different. I, I still call it the ether, but it's something that I really started to not only believe, but almost like worship. Like it's, it's like a, it's like another thing out there that that exists that I strongly believe in. And um, ever since I started changing my mindset towards that, and 
Uh, I've noticed I'm just generally more of a happy person. I, I think about everything in a different state of mind, and it makes me more um, more willing to, to go after opportunities. Perfect example is here with Cedric. Like all he did was <clears throat> he sent out um, an email to every CS student at Wisconsin looking for a web designer, and um, for me, like right away, I replied, "I'm like hell yeah, like this is an opportunity. I'm going to take advantage of it." But obviously, Cedric didn't get too many responses, and for me, because I was so willing to just go after those opportunities, because I had this state of mind, um, you know, that that's what really distinguished me from everyone else, and. Um, that's that's really at the end of the day like if you're if you're willing to go after these opportunities and you're not thinking like oh I have to go to class today I have X amount of homework to do I have to go see my girlfriend um, but rather you're seeing these opportunities and willing to chase after them um, you know that's so powerful and right here is a, is a perfect example if I hadn't replied to that email just that simple little email of said you're looking for a website I wouldn't be sitting here today and I wouldn't even be a part of spectrum so yeah very cool I'm, I'm on chapter two of that book right now <laughs> and there's a reason that it's a hundred year old book and it's still like a top seller on Amazon yeah, so no, it, it, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't good yeah it's, what about you, Taylor? Or, um, uh, how, how do I follow that one up? Oh <laughs> yeah. my god, it was like a... You don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many cliche books. You know, I could tell you like the Harry Potter series or... You know. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, um, I think one book that um, did not guide me because I wanted to be like the subject of the book, but more... It was more a book about humanity and the trials of, of growing and, and growing company too, was the Steve Jobs biography. Um, and I know it's received a ton of criticism uh, for, for good reason that, you know, it gave a lot of people permission to be assholes uh, because he was generally, you know, not a good person uh, to deal with, but he, he was a visionary and everything. But I, I think that book showed me that um, there, there were no predefined rules. Um, I didn't have to act like Steve Jobs. I don't want to act like him. But the way that he acted exemplified that, that he did what he wanted uh, and he did it the way he, he wanted to. And that was what I pulled away from that book more than, more than uh, to park in the handicapped spot or to, to yell at my coworkers or anything like that. Yeah. It, was, it was really... <laughs> is really the yeah i went a little deeper than that okay me, so yeah that, that, i've read it it's a great book all right well that about wraps it up um so if people want to get in touch with you um tell us about your website you know any social media you want to you want to promote or how yeah. i can get in touch with you guys go to spectrum 3d.com right now <laughs> right, right now it out. <laughs> We have a blog. We have all sorts of cool pictures. We're going to oh, keep yeah. you posted on there. If you go to our blog, so we're updating it like once a week with cool stuff that we're doing in color. So like we 3D print these darts that they're like the coolest things because they have spiral wings. And so you can never you can never like buy a dart like this, but uh, because of the way that they're designed, you can throw them underhand and and that makes them like you, know, you can whip them behind your back and they they self correct in their their like flight trajectory. So th there's all this cool stuff. On the blog, and we're updating it while we're not, you know, uh, trying to do all this R and D. So, uh, yeah, go check it out. Yeah, while awesome. you're there, subscribe to our email list, follow us on Twitter, all yeah. that, all, all that right. good stuff. And the website Excellent. is spectrum, s p e c t r o m, three d dot com. Thanks again for joining us today. If you like what you hear, head over to driventobetter.com. Check out the show notes where we'll have everything we talked about here today. You can just search the name of the guest or their company, and that should pop up for you. While you're there, consider joining our DTB Plus Club. If you're not sure what that is, some of our guests will come to us with special offers, giveaways, contests, or discounts for our audience. The only way to get these is to become a member of the DTB Plus Club. In addition to bi-weekly emails with these offers, you'll also get exclusive access to the Plus Club private at Facebook page. This is a place where like-minded entrepreneurs and soon-to-be entrepreneurs gather and exchange ideas, tips, and advice. Our guests talk a lot about having a support community, and the DTV Plus Club is just that. The best part is it's absolutely free to join, so head over to driventobetter.com now and check it out. Thanks again. See you next time.